welcome back, listeners, to That's a Good Card. Today, y'all will have the challenge of getting me to say, that's a good card. While y'all will be doing the convincing, I will be playing the devil's advocate. If you're interested in more Tag C content, check out our Patreon in the link down below. Also, now's a good time to remind you to hit that subscribe button if you're listening to us on YouTube, and please, 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 please leave a comment below with your thoughts on today's topic, as well as your suggestion for our next card. Today's card was wonderfully suggested to us by Gold Sabretooth, a.k.a. Tim, the best artist in the CEDH sphere. Absolutely. So check the description below for links to his Etsy. Why not support an awesome member of our CEDH community? All right, y'all. Are you ready to bring us the suggestion? Yeah. Thanks, Gold Sabretooth, for this recommendation. Um, he had recommended a card called Whirlwind of Thought. Uh, I really kind of like the art on this thing. It is for one generic uh, mana cost plus blue, red, and white. Or Jeskai, I'm pretty sure. Yep. He had this to say about this card. Any brew in those colors that is interested in card advantage that doesn't already have it in the command zone should look at it. Amazing in Brea or Jeska Ishai, if anybody is still playing that card. <laughs> that, that commander. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that deck, yeah. And I'm not sure about Jessica Ishai itself, but when I looked at CEDH analytics, this card came up about 16 times, uh, which is definitely on the fringe end. Uh, and it's seen yep. pretty much in Elsha. I don't think I saw it in any Narset decks. Um, no, there were a couple. Uh, there's were a couple. there? Okay. Yeah, there's a couple of Narset decks, but I think it's like Elsha and Narset decks. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. If you guys know of any other Jeskai decks that may be playing this, let us know below. Um, or four or five color decks. Mm -hmm. Let's go over that. So let's go over why we think this card could deserve to be in the main deck. So the first point I have that is in these colors, I think you're going to be trying to slightly storm off a, a little bit, uh, a little bit of backstory. I think one of the first decks I tried to make CEDH, uh, it kind of failed miserably at the time, uh, was uh, an Elsha the Infinite deck? Of oh. the Infinite. Elsha of the Infinite. Yep, 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 that's it. Elsha is not infinite, but they are of, of the Infinite. The infinite. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was one of the first ones because, probably because it was a part of a pre-con uh, deck, and I was like, sweet, I can go buy that pre-con. This is back when I was buying pre-cons instead of singles, like I should be, and I uh, was trying to kind of see if, I, with the cards I had, like I could somehow break the CEDH meta. Uh, spoilers, I did not. But I do have it. Actually, it's upstairs right now, uh, kind of put together. And in a deck like Elsha, um, a card like Whirlwind of Thought lets you cantrip with every one of your non-creature spells. Yep. Which you're running qu quite a bit of. And you're running cards um, that will be drawing you cards. And then this will draw you mar more cards. And I just really love the the value from a, a card like this is, I think, really kind of neat. And what else do you want to be doing in CEDH but drawing cards, right? And trying to get yeah. towards your win conditions. So that's my first point. Yeah, it's it's unique, but it's not necessarily a payoff that is no. unknown to the CEDH realm. No, 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 I mean, like all. obviously, drawing cards is really good. <laughs> but it's not something that we normally... like. It's, it's close, because I guess let's look at it this way. Sometimes we see enchantments that provide card advantage. We see that with Ristic Study and right. Mystic Remora. Those are like some of the best ones that we see in the meta. So that's not necessarily a new thing, but the whole casting a spell will get you a card mm -hmm. is somewhat that it's something that's a little bit unique, because normally I guess you see it in the flipped sense of yes. like your opponents cast spells, then you tax them. This is kind of like a self-enabler, kind of similar to Lotho. You know, some of the flack, and I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing, but some of the flack that like a Timna Krom gets is that you just gotta sit back and do your own thing, right? Like you don't you don't have to do anything. You just sit there, don't play any politics, just go, I'm uh do you pay the you one? Do you pay the one? You just yep. build, you farm cards, um, like it's it's your business. And if you wanna have a slightly more uh agency in in your fate, like I think a card like this, where if you're looking to storm off, like this will just draw you into more cards. And so, while this is four costs, it costs one more than Ristic Study, right? Um, yeah, you're controlling your own fate, and I kind of really like that about a card like this, where it's 
not necessarily waiting. I'm that one of those players that likes to like wait with a mind break trap and like you're just waiting for that person to kind of do their thing and it's like a uh, kind of a gotcha. And I like that this card allows me to, as I'm doing my thing, it gets me a reward every single time. Yeah. Kind of like it's the old like Enterprise Rent a Car. Right. They give you the you. keys to be your own boss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, actually, I was just going <laughs> to compare it a little bit to uh, Corvold. Corvold makes treasures cantrips, right? You you do the you do the dockside thing, and every one of those those treasures that you get, like you're doing what the commander wants you to do. Uh, in this case, you're doing what the card wants you to mm, do. You're casting spells, and I it's rewarding you uh, for doing something for you're your gonna own do. game actions. Yes, yeah. So you're not necessarily reliant. Your second point is you're not necessarily reliant on the game actions of your opponents, so they can't play around it like you can for Ristic Studies, right? Where I mean, when Ristic Studies out or multiple Ristic Studies, then <laughs> yeah, it's, like you start getting in this place where you know when you can play your cards and when you can pay and when it's safe to not pay and you kind of build this web of a plan of how am I going to play through Ristic Study. With this card, you don't have to worry about that. You don't. Your opponents can't really react to it. Because it's all about what you're doing Correct. in order to enable this. Yep. And so, I mean, sometimes it's like you don't want to be feeding Aristic, but at the same time, by feeding Aristic in this case, you're also feeding yourself, right? Like, y y mm -hmm. Kyle eats, I eat. And so as long as we're both eating, like, hopefully you're also you're drawing into more and that you're building more advantage. Um, and I think a card like this can kind of really help get you there. And I think the last point I have is that I think in the past with a card like this, you were kind of like limited to game actions or then maybe one or two spells on your opponent's turn. Like we just talked about agency and now I'm bringing up the fact that like you're only kind of getting agency on your own turn. But I think that, you know, WotC <laughs> is always pushing the format and, and pushing, you know, new magic cards out. And so with cards like Valley Floodcaller, which allows you to ca cast non-creature spells uh, as if they had flash. And um, there is a second ability, but I don't think we're as worried about that second ability as to the- To pump up your animals. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll throw it on the screen. <laughs> you you ha now have a card like uh, the Sweet Sweet Otter, and it's enabling you to cast non-creature spells. So your artifacts now will draw you a card uh, on an opponent's turn. And you can kind of, you're, you're able to kind of Mm, do I the see. blue thing right which is sometimes just like draw your card for the turn and pass and if you have a valley flood color out you can kind of start also storming off almost at any point as long as it's not I a see what you're super saying. creature intensive uh combo deck so let me get this straight yeah. just to clarify you're saying that because there's these new things like valley flood color or like the ley line of anticipation tech like yeah. things that let you play spells at flash speed that you normally wouldn't or just like what Elsha does in general. Yep. Um, of just looking at the top of the library, you can cast it with Flash. Yeah. I think that you're saying that you'll be able to draw cards on opponents' turns, which makes this card inherently more valuable. So you I can like so. dig for answers on the I other turns, so. or potentially go for a win while also refueling your hand as you're going for a win. Yeah. Is that the thought process? That's the thought process. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Because there's going to be a lot of things like artifacts or sorceries that would trigger this generally speaking or enchantments i guess it's just anything that's not a creature. anything that wouldn't have no, that's not an instant yeah, yeah it will anything oh. that's not an instant that wouldn't normally yes. get triggered yep, on an yep. opponent's turn is kind of what i'm trying to say yeah, oh, yeah i yeah, understand yeah. that instance trigger this i'm just trying to say like specifically for your third point of it's valuable it's increased value because of how many enablers there are for playing cards on your opponent's turn that you normally wouldn't be able to mm. therefore Drawing cards in your opponent's turn is pretty solid as well. I like that. That's that's kind of where I, I'm kind of getting at. I think it's niche, or not necessarily niche, but it's like a it's a lesser point of why this card is good. But at the same time, they keep printing these really freaking good cards, like Valley Flood Caller, or I like the Leyline Tech. I'm a big Leyline Tech. We have to do a video on that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but um, or and even just E Zone in general, because like E Zone is just so freaking powerful. Yeah. Unfortunately, Jess guy isn't in green, so you don't have like the access to Crop Rot to get E Zone a lot easier. But uh, maybe in a four color deck or a five color deck, if you're trying to test this out, I can see it. Yeah, 
Um, but those are kind of the the three main points I thought of that I think people should really consider. I'm actually am looking. I think I have a copy of this card. I was digging around for it before we started recording, but I still have to find it. So I'm actually kind of really looking forward to trying to at least test this out. Yeah. All right, Kyle. Well, let's talk about some of the downsides somebody should consider before they start running Whirlwind of Thought. All right. Time to rip into this card. Let's put go. on my devil's advocate hat. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. <laughs> my first downside. This is the elephant in the room, which is <laughs> this fucking mana cost has half the rainbow in it, man. Like <laughs> more than half, technically. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. So like one colorless, a blue pip, a red pip, and a white pip. Like talk about difficult to cast. It's the first thing that I look at when I was evaluating this card. When it was suggested to us, I immediately went, oh, four mana, that's not that bad. And they went, whoa, look at that thing. <laughs> so, I mean, it's no, like, we don't have to stick on this topic, but it's kind of going to lead into my second point. So point one and point two are going to, blur together so follow follow with me if you can y'all <laughs> but in terms of the four mana cost i did some digging into the top deck open and use this as kind of the our, our navigating compass on looking at lists that are jeskai plus so jeskai in four or five colors as well and kind of looked at what other cards similar to this just four mana value pieces like how many we saw at the top deck invitational that could be in this color pie and it was kind of interesting. In all the blue farm lists that I saw in the top 16 of, of this, and a little bit outside the top 16 as well, there were only a few cards that even went past three CMC. So like four or five CMC cards in blue farm specifically basically didn't exist. We're talking about MBT, which is a free card, so I don't even count that, right? Yep. Mind Break Trap. We're talking about Phyrexian Metamorph, which is technically a four cost card, but really it's really? a three cost card yeah. with two yep. life, right? So that yep. doesn't count. Talking about Force of Will, which is also a free card, so that yep. doesn't count. And then the only real other thing we were seeing is Ad Nauseam, which is a one-card win condition for five mana, and, like, this is not a one-card con win condition for four mana, so, I mean, <laughs> it's not even in the same realm. Um, the, I guess one more honorable mention, it wasn't in some of the top ones, but it was in, or maybe it was in, like, one of the middling ones, uh, it was Smothering Tithe. Yeah. It's a common type. enough card. Yeah, so so Smothering Type is a staple. We understand what it does. For four mana, it's giving you tremendous value. I think that card is probably the most similar and another one that we'll talk about in a second of like fills the same niche, right? Which is the One Ring. We didn't see it in a lot of blue farm lists, but I did see it in other lists at the Top Deck Invitational. So if we start getting into like adding green or like the five color stuff like we saw a little bit of beseech the mirror we saw a little bit of calling ritual or like even like bigger creatures you'll see heartbreaker horror or seedborn muse but those don't really kind of fall into the same category in terms of like four mana value engine or four mana draw engine we just don't see a lot of it so that's my first point it's a crazy cost to cast at four mana and it's also just something that we're not like the the niche of a four mana value draw engine is not really there in this color pairing specifically. I see what you're saying for sure. I mean, like it doesn't have and and for the cost, you're also saying like it doesn't have the same kind of impact, right, as some of these other cards do, yeah. right? That really can kind of control the 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 pace of the game, right? And this one doesn't. It doesn't control the pace of a game like a Rissic Study does, right? Like, mm -hmm. Rissic Study makes you pause and go, oh, do I storm off now? Like, because now your actions is going to give advantage to somebody else. Yeah. And that, that kind of leads to my second point, which is, uh, let's talk about what's really close to it in terms of what role it fills, and that's the One Ring. Yep. So this card and the One Ring, I think, are very similar. Yeah, I think And I think, I think that so. decks that are in this color pairing and are playing the One Ring can also consider this and that honestly could be the slot that you're swapping out to test to see how this card feels so let's talk about the benefits of each, si each side right one ring first and foremost the etb ability super relevant yep protection from everything is pretty freaking awesome it has come up it comes up in a lot of games it comes up every all the time so super awesome we love that it is a little slow to start which is where i think that this card has a little bit of an edge 
because the one ring kind of takes either something else to enable it, like a Manamo to like kind of get it going or an unwinding clock, Seaboard Muse, whatever, right? It kind of needs an extra piece to make it really powerful. Otherwise, it's pretty slow to as a four mana draw engine. Mm -hmm. It's relatively slow, right? So Whirlwind of Thought has a slight advantage over it in a sense that the second you play it, if you're able to cast zero cost spells, like if you're able to cast a mana rock, like a, a lotus petal, you know, something you can get immediate value or realize value probably quicker than you can with the one ring. On the other hand, the one rings mana cost. Let's talk about that. It's four mana. It's the same exact thing, but it's the easiest freaking mana cost you can possibly have. Four generic mana is the easiest possible way. Like the, it's the best that you can possibly have for this pairing. Um, I, I think that one of the things I, I kept thinking about with this color triplet <laughs> that's like pairings is like it's three yeah. colors, right? It's not even just like two colors, right? Which I think would make it a little mm -hmm. bit easier. Like you kind of do narrow the decks, right? Like we keep talking about Elsha, but you know, um, this could be technically run in Timnacrom, right? It could be run in yeah. a... Uh, Brea, right, which is uh, Jeskai yep. plus Black and then Jeskai Ish Ishai, right? It can definitely be played in. And, you know, I, I want to go back to what Gold Sabertooth was trying to say is like, you know, we're looking to this card is trying to fill the spot where your 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 commander is really just there for the combo piece, right? Like, it's just there for combo. It's not really there. It doesn't have advantage. Uh, like you kind of want to see in a lot of your um, in, in your commanders nowadays. Yeah, it's more of a like he's he's saying that this needs to bolster the decks yes. that are in this color pairing that don't have the card advantage in the command zone. Correct. Right. So it's bolstering. It's bringing up the shortcomings of certain commanders in this color pairing that don't have the card advantage. And it, like it's just basically recouping what's keeping these decks back, which is not having that card advantage. Card advantage, yeah. It's a really, it is yeah. a really big and, thing. And I did want to circle back to the second point that I was trying to make because I was, I know I was taking a long time to get no worries, to it. No but the the point that I was trying to make was, I think that this shouldn't be considered as much because of how similar the One Ring and this card are to each other. But it's and I think that cast. it's very clear to me that the One Ring is better than this card. Unless I can be given, yeah. like, so the one benefit that it has, like I was saying, I was trying to get to, the one benefit is when you play it, you can enable yourself quickly if you have all of those pieces lined up. But when I started making that argument to myself, I started realizing that, hey, the One Ring's kind of the same shit. Like, if you already have Minamo, or you already have an Untopper on the board, then you're going to realize a similar amount of value from the One Ring that you would from this card. So... I think that if we're looking at those two differences, I don't know if you can find that many decks that want to play both. Sure, maybe in this Jeskai pairing that Tim is talking about, where you're really lacking on card draw and you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, Ristic Study and Mystic Remora are not enough. I can potentially see it, but if you're in a four or five color pie, you're probably playing... Timna or Krom in your command zone or some kind of commander that's going to give you card advantage already. So I, I just can't see it being played outside of those pairings. It's pretty much strictly niche into the Jeskai color pie, in my personal opinion. Jeskai plus one other, right? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, yep, yep. maybe, but honestly, not really. I, <laughs> it's hard to say because there could be other, if you add in green or you add in black, you're unlocking other card advantage engines. If you were going into green, now you have access to Sylvan Library. Would you play Sylvan Library over this? Probably, because it's a lot easier to cast and get out early. I'm not even a big Sylvan Library guy, and you know this. I've oh, no, talked you, a lot of trash yeah, on yeah, Sylvan yeah, yeah, Library yeah, oh, yeah. in general, oh, yeah. oh, because yeah. I don't think it's that great, especially in OBM meta. It's tough. But that being said, I think that once you start exiting the Jeskai Pie, you go there and you get, you know, you go to... You go to green and you get Sylvan Library or you get I'm trying to think of other card advantages in green. And I'm sure that people are going to say in the comments down below. Viridian what those are, but... Revel, Kyle. Viridian <laughs> okay, Revel, yeah, bro. Oh, yeah. How Come can on, I forget? Bro. A great card. It's a good card. <laughs> Listen to it. Episode 12. Yeah. I can't wait for us to do a patron review of that episode. <laughs> 
Yeah, dude. <laughs> um, but anyway, getting back to it, if then if you're in black, you now have access to like pseudo car other card advantage engine like you just have necropotence, necropotence. like <laughs> like you can just you can just win the game <laughs> instead so it's just a weird it's a weird spot for this specific color pie that was my second point it's just mm. it's similar to one ring and i think the one ring is strictly better i don't know how often you're going to want to be playing both maybe you do drawing cards is pretty fucking good i don't know i mean people those same <laughs> decks the same decks that could run this are already running Ristic Study and, well, in this color, uh, Ristic Study, One Ring and Esper Sentinel and, yeah, Fish, right? Like, Esper Sentinel is definitely in there. Who knows? Maybe they got Delny and they're doubling it up. Uh, my last point is something that I actually, that was actually brought up to me by um, a new to Elsha pilot, a friend of mine, who started piloting Elsha recently. And we had a conversation about whether or not this card could be good in Elsha or what their thoughts were overall. Uh, shout out, Bench. Um, but we were kind of talking about how it's kind of a little bit of a non-bow for certain types of Elsha decks. Yeah, certain I types of Elsha decks, you're trying to play off the top of your library specifically to give things flash. And if you're trying to win on someone else's turn and dig into like a combo piece or something like that, and you accidentally draw the card instead of playing on the top. But it's like, it's like this weird scenario though, because at the same time, you can look, so you know what the card is that you're going to draw, so you could potentially respond. But yeah. at the same time, the sequencing could get a little murky. So yeah. it's like kind of a nombo. It's not like it completely shuts it down by any means because yeah. you can kind of you can piece together whether or not you want to cast or draw it. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that both of those options are a good thing, if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. I mean, I've had similar thoughts when I was trying to learn to play. Maybe this is why I can't pilot this. Hey, because I'm <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, dude, why did uh, I, I hate that I drew this card, right? That I really what I really want to do is just to pull this out with Sisse, right? Instead of having it in my hand, now I have to cast it and it'll probably get uh, countered. I want it to be able to just kind of come in via this. So I, I definitely know what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, it's not a full like 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 stopper, like I said, because you yeah. can look at the top, respond if you need to cast that specific thing. But sometimes with sequencing, it can get a little dicey where you might not want to cast it just yet or... Yeah. You know, you it, it's just weird. I think that that's like my final downside and it's a super niche. But since we were talking about the decks that this could go in and this being one of them, I figured it was worth mentioning, yeah. even though like the benefit of just having something that draws you a bunch of cards is probably better, regardless of like some slight non bow. But it's tough to say. And like I said, I'm not an Elsha pilot, so I would love to hear from Elsha pilots. If you are listening to this podcast, you're an Elsha pilot. And you think that this could potentially disrupt what you're trying to do, or it's just really good and you don't really care about that, please tell us in the comments below. Same to the Brea pilots and Will and Lucas. I was thinking, thinking about this for, I was actually just sitting here thinking about Will and Lucas a little bit. It's a deck I'm thinking about putting together. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. sound off below. All right, Kyle, it's time to talk about the point you made that I think makes the most sense as the biggest downside. And it was right in there for me around <laughs> in between your first and your second point. And okay. the thing that you, you mentioned a little bit, and I'll state it again, I think it is it is the colors themselves, right? The red, white, blue pip plus a generic mana can just be, yeah. with a card like this, I would want it down turn two, right? Like turn three and four and beyond. Like people have really established themselves and like yeah. maybe if this might be a good catch up card, but you're also paying four mana on turn two or three to kind of do it. And you're doing it with very specific colors. And I, I think at that point you could find yourself really behind. And so that's a really, yeah, a big downside to me. And we, we didn't talk about it either, but if we're in the same realm of four mana things as trouble in pairs, and we don't see that played a lot, not, and not I've true. and I think part of the reason why is those double white pips make it difficult for the decks that might want it. So yep, even yep, like yep. if you're playing blue farm, being able to cast that double white pip early can be difficult. And I, if that if double white pip plus two colorless is considered difficult, then I think that this is definitely more difficult than that. Yep, that's definitely something you have to really think about. All right, Kyle, how about the upside that you think best supports for why you want to put this card in your deck? Yeah, so the upside that you brought that I thought was the best point that you made was that, <laughs> this sound really silly, but drawing cards is really fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> so like your first point of just like, this is just, it just makes everything a cantrip. I love it. I love that. I think 
you know, now that I can take my devil horns off and talk about it a little bit, like, yeah, I was kind of, you know, saying, you know, you no, might not sure. want to run too many ways to draw cards. Me personally, fuck it. I want to draw all the cards. Like, Absolutely. give me all the cards. Let's throw in more card advantage. Sure, why not? I get that there is a line that has to be drawn where, okay, you have too much value. You need to be doing something else. You need to be ramping or you need to be having more combo pieces to win the game or more protection. Like, there is a balance to all deck building that all deck builders know about. And it's not necessarily an exact science. No. Nope. If it were an exact science, this podcast wouldn't exist. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I personally think the fact that it basically says in, in my caveman brain, cast spell, draw a card, I'm in. <laughs> sure, why not? Cast spell, draw a card sounds good to me. I'm a Storm Corvold player, so I would love something like that. Every time I cast a spell, I draw a card. That's essentially what it's saying. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, that's your best point. It's pretty funny that your favorite point of mine, or your favorite downside of mine was the elephant in the room, which is that casting cost is wild. It's kind of wild. And then, and then the point that I liked best of yours is like the, yeah, it draws you cards seems pretty good. <laughs> you know, and I great think- job. Yeah, we did such great we did, we did. analysis of this. Like, <laughs> screw all the other things that we were talking about and really getting into niche scenarios. Screw that. It's just draw card good. <laughs> casting cost difficult bad bad <laughs> um so, all right Kyle. with all of that said what is your opinion here uh have you changed your mind on this card what do you think about whirlwind of thought is whirlwind of thought a good card no smile <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> don't be sorry don't the be sorry don't be sorry no <laughs> we, we're gonna go with that uh like so let's go back to let's let's bring it all the way back to the original post which was any brew in those colors that are interested in card advantage that doesn't already have it in the command zone should look at it right. aka brea or jessica ishai yep i agree with that sentiment but at the same time, no flame to those decks. The reason they're not seeing as good a performance is because, because they, they don't, don't have, have card, card advantage, advantage in the command zone. Yep. So I, it's so hard to justify playing the catch-up game, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and I trust me, I uh, completely understand. I am a Corvold player. Yep. We have the worst conversion rate for top 16s of any deck that's in the top 30, it's not even close. It's like 14%. Yeah. I should be playing Rogsai. All the mathematics <laughs> tell me I should not be playing the deck I'm playing, so I get it. If you're a Brea stan, if you're a Jessica Ishai stan, if you're just a just a, a Jessica I stan in general, I'm rocking with you, but at the same time, if we're digging this low into the bottom of the barrel, those intrusive thoughts start coming into your head. And I, like I said, I know these intrusive thoughts. I live it every day. <laughs> every time my deck is just not, you know, it's not quite as good as the best turbo deck in the format. I get it. But that's kind of, you know, maybe I'm just meta pilled now going to this many tournaments. I, yeah, I can see that. I don't want to say that it's completely a bad card, but for now I am not completely sold on it. I would love to hear people in the comments who play just guy, or play Jeskai Plus, any sort of deck like that. If they have seen this card be used for complete success or awesomeness, please share in the comments down below. I'd love to hear about it. But for now, we might have to check back in on this one. I agree with you. And I think the last thing in, in, in all of that, when you were going <laughs> in our like very caveman brains, draw card good, and um, but hard to cast, bad. I think that the reason we don't see this card more the reason it isn't is because at the end of the day, this is an actually a, a well balanced magic card. It is oh, not busted. I, I agree. It's agree. not busted. It is. I subscribe to that. To to do the thing you already want to do, cast spells, you have to pay not just four, but you have to pay. F- uh, you have to play Jeskai plus one more, right? Like you have to pay those yeah. three colors plus one more, and it's too fair of a magic card. Yeah. It's too fair for CEDH. <laughs> it's too fair for CEDH. I think it is a very good card in the sense of like, it's a good, well-balanced magic card that does a thing at a fair cost. It is not yep. busted. And I think that might be one of the biggest reasons we don't see it. But if you're trying to bring fairness back to CEDH, let us know down below and let us know fairness. how you're going to... 
right? <laughs> Let us know how uh, what you think about it uh, because I'm going to be oh, trying. Oh man! All right, is it time for oh, yeah. our favorite closing segment? That's a good card question mark. All right, listeners, if you haven't played our that's a good card question mark game that we like to uh, have fun playing at the end of our videos, I will explain what we're trying to do. I believe it's this week. Yeah, you're going to be giving me a card. I'm giving right? you a card. Cool. So you'll give me the name of a card, and I'm going to try my best to guess everything about this card. It will be an obscure magic card, hopefully one that I have never heard of before. And you can play along, listener, and try to guess what you think this obscure magic card is or what it does. Type, color, everything about it. All right, y'all. Let's get into it. What's my card name for today? Okay. This has seen one printing. So have you heard, Ooh. or what do you think, Outer Pine of Jukai is Elder Pine of Jukai. Elder Pine of Jukai. Mm -hmm. Wow. I have <laughs> no idea. Elder Pine sounds like an old tree. Let's just. And then the of Jukai is just like a proper noun. It's a place, a person, location. I don't know. So I'm going to say it's a legendary creature. Okay. It's green, but because it's legendary, it's giving me this idea that it might be another color as well. So I'm going to go, it's going to be green and oh, what is the Elder Pine of Jukai? It's not giving Golgari, maybe white, green, white. Yeah, let's go Celestia, green, white. So it's green, white. It's going to, it's going to be a creature, a legendary creature, tree, ooh, mmm. Legendary creature plant. We're going to go plant. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Legendary creature plant. And then, or it's going to be four mana cost. So mm -hmm. two colorless pips mm -hmm. and then Celestia. And it's going to read, oh, well, let's do the artwork first while I think about what it does. The artwork, this elder pine is going to be a rolling hill. There's going to be a rolling hill. Rolling hill. I like it. And there's going to be at the top of the hill... Like this one lone pine. Kind of like that place. Oh, there's that place in Europe that was like the gap. And then there was a, one singular tree. I think that there mm -hmm. was like, it was in the news because some kid cut it down or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be like It's going to be like that. Okay. That that view is just one sole elder pine on a hillside. And then the ability... Well, I said it's a creature, right? You <laughs> so did. Let me give you it did. its a power and toughness. I said it's a creature. Oh, I'm, I hate this so much. It's so bad. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be a... What did I say? It was four cost. Jeez. It's, it's going to yeah. be a two seven. Oh, okay. You know, it's a legendary. Two eight. Let's make it huge. Oh, okay. It's a two eight two defender. Eight. Def yeah, and it's okay. going to say tap it or attach any number of equipment to target creature. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just want you to know I'm recording this so that I can send this to uh, Gavin Verhe and Mark Rosewater for your audition towards uh, being a card designer. This is awesome. No, this was the worst one I've ever done. This is the this is this is bad. I regret everything. Okay, tell me what this card does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Outer Pine of Jukai is a green creature card. You were dead. Uh, you you got you got those two points right there, buddy. I was not dead on. I, I added in white for no reason. I shouldn't have. But. <laughs> it is uh, uh fully just green. It is two generic and one green pip, so three costs. It is a creature spirit. Damn it! It's not a plant. I, I still had hope that it could be a plant. <laughs> two power, one toughness. That's terrible. It says, whenever you play a spirit or arcane spell, reveal the top three cards of your library. Put all land cards revealed this way into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Second ability, it has Soul Shift 2. Soul Shift 2 means when this creature dies, you may return target spirit card with mana value 2 or less from your graveyard to your hand. What? Yep. And I'm not going to lie to you, I don't understand this art. I'm going to right now send this to you so that you can post the, the, put the, the picture up react. right now because okay. I have no idea what that is. It kind of looks like a weird helicopter thing. thing. I have no idea. I cannot make heads or tails. What in tarnation? What is this? 
What is this? I don't. I. It kind of looks like some dragonfly thing with a. Uh, I don't know. It looks like a. It's crazy. If, if this looks if, like a thing of nightmares, I'm not gonna lie. Listeners, if you know, please explain to us. We are kind of lost. Yeah. Ah. Uh, Outer part of Jukai. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know what? This card seems really bad. So my card's better. My card uh, would be so a too. Voltron's. Dude. Would be a Voltron Dex dream. <laughs> I also think it's really interesting when you and I are pressured, we always automatically go to activated ability. We almost never say triggered yeah. ability. I don't think I've ever given out a triggered ability. Uh, I always do activated ability. Almost always. True. True. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode on Whirlwind of Thought. And thank you so much to Gold Sabretooth for today's recommendation. Please direct your attention down below to our description where you'll find links to our Discord as well as links to our link tree where you will find links to all the places that we host our podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Spotify. And please, 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 please don't forget to leave a like and a comment down below with your thoughts on today's topic as well as your suggestion for our next card. Also, if you're interested in additional content, check out our Patreon. We have a full podcast released on there, as well as plans for other patron-exclusive content. All right, y'all. We will see you next Monday. Thanks, y'all. See ya.